Today we are, we're wrapping up a six-week series that we've just simply titled IDK. I don't know. And we've been asking and answering some of the most challenging questions that we have regarding our faith. And we've just simply said every single week, you're designed to learn, to grow, to question, and to accept truth. It's a healthy part of our lives that you are not designed just to, to be born into the world and know everything. God wanted you to learn and grow and, and to kind of embrace that. And so over the last few weeks, we've talked about what to do with your life. We've talked about how to deal with doubt and the church's role in our world. We talked about hot topics, which probably was my favorite message out of all of them because I just like to, I like to meddle just a little bit sometimes. I like to kind of uh, talk about the things that others want to shy away from. We talked about conflict and today for the last week what we've been doing is we've been uh, receiving your text in questions and so I've got 14 of them. We've narrowed them down uh, from, uh, from many others to try and group as many together. Are y'all ready for a little Q&A? Hey, you asked for it, and so we're going to give you the best biblical answers we can. Before I start to jump into those questions, uh, I do want to give you a couple of ground rules. How many of y'all know we need some ground rules? Come on, all right? Come on, first ground rule is keep your elbows to yourself, all right? Some of y'all sitting next to somebody, and I'm going to hit your question that they don't know is your question. You're going to be like poking. No, no, just, just stay in here, okay? That is not in my ground rules. It's just extra. It's just being nice is what it is, all right? Uh, a couple of things we always say around here is that we say that the, where the Bible is clear, that's what we believe. And so if there's a clear verse that says this is right and this is wrong, we've just accept what the Bible says is true. Can I get a good amen from somebody out there? Where the Bible is unclear, we look for principles because there are lots of principles that apply to other areas of our lives and where we can't find a principle, it's okay to start having some opinions. I would say in regard to your opinions, we should let the Bible define and balance itself before we start adding opinions. Can I say that again? We should let the Bible define and balance itself before we start adding opinions. In our world today, we have people grabbing one obscure random verse out of a crazy place in the Bible, and they start building all sorts of habits and extreme ideas out of it. We believe in the whole of the Bible. We believe that the Bible, it, it defines itself and balances itself so that you can be healthy. And yes, there are some kind of side issues that if you just take that one thought there without the whole thought, you can say, well, that's crazy. Well, that's everybody's life, right? If I took just one of your thoughts today, <laughs> you could be crazy too, all right? Here's why we believe in the Bible this way. It's going to be on the screen. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture, how much of it? Come on, say it with me. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. We believe that the Bible is the standard for our lives. And as your pastor for many, many years, you know, if you've been around for any amount of time, I, I am always hesitant to give opinions. I'm always going to stay in the principle of God's word. I don't want to preach my good ideas. I want to preach God's good ideas. And so uh, also, please forgive the brevity of some of the answers, because if we are going to hit the 14 of them, then some of them are just going to be like, don't do that. All right. <laughs> some of them are going to be quick and then some issues um, don't impact eternity let me just say this real quick there are some things in our faith that don't determine heaven and hell we do believe heaven and hell are realities for us and listen some people say why would God ever send someone to hell he's not you're sending yourself God created a standard he created a solution and he created a way out you either accept that standard and that solution and that way out or you decide to pay for for your own mistakes. So God's not sending anyone anywhere you deciding to go. Can I just say that one more time? All right. And so our hearts are open to what he wants to say, but there are some things that just aren't heaven and hell. And listen, we are not going to divide our church over rock music. Amen, everybody. Listen, if you don't like rock music, you, you can leave. I'm just kidding. I'm Y'all follow me today, right? We've got all these kind of side issues that really aren't that big a deal. What are, the, what are the heaven and hell issues, Jesus, the Bible, and you and I must be born again? There are really only three of them, all right? Jesus, the Bible, y'all say it with me, come on. Jesus, the Bible, and you must be born again, right? Your life has to change in order to show the work of Jesus in your life. Those are the big rock things, and all the others, we can kind of take time, we can learn, we can grow, we can work together, and uh, so, so, so you should know Christian, Christian denominations today. So you go Catholic, you go Baptist, you go Methodist, you go Presbyterian, you go, come on, you fill in all the other blanks, right? 
How, how many of y'all grew up with a Catholic background? Show me your hand real quick. Show me your hand. All right, got a bunch of y'all in here. How many of y'all grew up uh, Methodist? Anybody Methodist? Got a few of those. Quiet church, right? Any Baptist? Any Baptist? Any Baptist? Come on. Any, any non-denominational Pentecostal? Come on, raise everything you got right there, right? We all grew up in different backgrounds. We all grew up diff- doing different things. But 85% of our principles are the same. 85% of our principles are the same. You know where we really differ? Is in our practices. Some like it quieter. Come on, some like it louder. That's how we say it around here. We believe that God has called us to be a generational church, an interracial church that rivals the house of blues. So if you want to know what our passion is, is being a place where old and young can do it together, where black, white, and brown can do it together, right? And, and when you go to the House of Blues, you're going to say, man, you, you need to go to my church, right? You, need a, you have never felt base like that in church, right? So that's our passion. So if you're ready, say, I'm ready. ready. All right, you might want to get something to take some notes with because I can't put everything I'm going to say on screen. Uh, but there will be a question, and then I'm going to try to give you a verse for every answer somewhere in there. Let's jump into it. Question number one, really fun. Can you still love God and love horror movies and hard rock music? Here's my answer. I hope so because I love hard rock music. You can keep the horror movies if you want, Okay. Here's the big deal. God's love isn't predicated on your good behavior. I'll say it one more time. God's love isn't predicated on our good behavior, but we do have to learn how to love God. You, you weren't born with the inherent knowledge of, of knowing how to love someone or even to love God. And, and the best way to love someone is to learn about them and then give them love in the way that they can receive it. Here's our key verse for this one. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. So uh, too much horror movie, too much other music, not enough worship. Your heart's going to fill up with something that you don't want to be in it. And so what I would just say is make sure that you're pouring in, come on, church and Jesus and worship. And, and if you see a horror movie, come on, it's Halloween time, you know. So like if you see one of those, like just let that be on the side. Can I get an amen? Amen, everybody, right? I'm not a big fan of horror movies. I don't know. Just the word horror is horrifying. Let's go. That's my answer. Number two, here we go. When the devil fell, did he have wings and lose them, or did he never have wings? (laughs) Well, they are referring to what Jesus said, or Jesus is referring to Isaiah 14 and 12 when he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now, if you know the historical account, uh, Satan was an angel in heaven who decided to rebel against God. And God, because of his rebellion, removed him from heaven. And this young person is actually from Kids Church. I just had to throw it in there for you guys. Kids Church asked, you know, what well, did Satan have wings? So here's, here's the answer. Angels in Scripture are often described as having wings. So the assumption is that Satan did have wings too. Since the Bible doesn't make it clear, he must still have them, but he's also been thrown out of heaven. So with or without wings, he's not getting back in, okay? He's not getting back in. So if you're concerned that he's going to figure out a way to get, you know, he's not, okay? When God says you're out, how many of y'all know you're out? Which is something you should remember today, because if you're still sensing the grace of God... If you're here and you're wondering, does God love me? Well, you wouldn't even be here questioning whether God loved you if God didn't want you to question whether he loves you. Deep thoughts with Pastor Josh today. He loves you and that's why he has you here. So quit rejecting yourself or saying God is rejecting you. He loves you. Yes, he has rejected Satan who has chosen to rebel against God. So wings or no wings, I don't really care. I just know he has no power for your life. He has no power for your life. Are y'all liking this pace so far? Some of them are going to take longer than this, all right? Number three, going deep end of the pool. Question number three, when is it appropriate to use the gifts of the Spirit, like praying in tongues and laying on hands, words of knowledge, etc.? Is the old Pentecostal style non-denominational church service wrong? Is it real or just a show? There's like seven questions right there. If you're unfamiliar with this subject matter, if you grew up in some of the quieter expressions of church, you may not have ever really heard about spiritual gifts. But in a couple of places in your Bible, Romans chapter 12, 
1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 5, and much of the first five books of the Old Testament describe at least 23 different spiritual gifts. So when you are born into the world, you have talent. When you are born again, God gives you spiritual gifts. I'm going to say it again. When you're born into the world, God has given you talents. But when you give your life to Christ, the Bible says that he gives and imparts spiritual gifts into your life. And the Bible describes at least 23. I don't think it's an exhaustive list. You could group the gifts into three areas. We would call them the first motivational gifts like teaching, exhortation, giving, leadership, mercy, prophecy, and service. These motivate people. Uh, Second grouping, we would call ministry gifts that are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. These are kind of ministry. Then there's a third group that we would call manifestation gifts. And here's where you get into the supernatural, like words of wisdom, words of knowledge, faith, healing, prophecy, discernment of spirit speaking in tongues and interpretation of tongues let me just say no one here has a problem with motivational or ministry gifts the only one that brings some confusion is when we get into supernatural things because we want to put everything in a neat little box that we can go to every time we want to talk about God and just pull a miracle out of a box right listen he is not a rabbit in a hat amen everybody so there are some things about God that he only did once And there are some things about God that he is willing to do over and over again, but it takes faith and it takes uh, us leaning into God and pursuing him. So we believe, here, here it is, we believe in all the spiritual gifts. We believe that all of them should be present in the church. All of them should be at use in the church. Uh, The one that is most confusing is when you hear speaking in tongues. You're like, okay, what does that mean? But let me just demystify it. Time out just for a minute. How many of y'all know that you speak in a tongue today? Everybody speaks English here. That's why you're here. (laughs) Mostly because, and then, so you speak, uh, you have a native tongue. The Bible speaks of at least three different kinds of tongues. A native tongue a heavenly language where it's just you and God, and then there is a tongue of interpretation where at times people would step up and begin to speak a language they didn't know, and then other people would understand what they were saying. So what we believe is if God created languages, we should never limit God. Amen, everybody? And so if he did it in the beginning, he can do it now. And what we say is as you read Scripture, 1 Corinthians 12 gives us a list of gifts. 1 Corinthians 13 gives us the fuel for gifts says that if you don't love people, it doesn't matter which gift you got. If your gift is about you, then, then you're, you're in the wrong place. If your gift is about show and tell, let me, let me show you what I can do. No, no, the, our gift is to give glory to God. 12 lists the gifts. 13 says this is the fuel. You need to have love. And chapter 14 is rules for the gifts. And so if you have a lot of questions about this, I would go to 1 Corinthians 14 where he specifically deals with tongues, tongues of interpretation, and how it should be in a service. And what we believe is, listen, if you've got a heavenly language, pray in your heavenly language. But when you're talking to people and trying to share, speak in a language they understand, right? And and why do we do this? Because the end of 1 Corinthians 14, one verse, real simple, says, but everything should be done. Come on, read it with me. In a fitting and orderly way. So just to to wrap it up, I do believe in all the gifts, and I have seen and operated in all of them. I speak in a a, a native language. I have a heavenly language. And as the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, I pray in tongues more than all of you. I have so many things that are so pressing that I don't even know how to pray. And Romans 8 says when you don't know how to pray, that there's a groaning that shows up inside of you that you begin to press into God and, and the Spirit prays through you. Here's what I know. Uh, there, are, there are things about God that are different than we understand, but that doesn't make God weird. That makes us weird. We like to say it's supernatural, but in heaven it's just natural. And it's us trying to allow the kingdom of heaven to come into our lives. But let me just say this. As you look at worship services of the past and how they were operated, they got real weird because people started making the gift about them rather than God. And it was like show and tell. We don't do that around here. And if you get too much, like if worship and service begins to focus everyone on you rather than on God, someone's going to tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, this is about God. So we do things in a fitting and orderly way, but I do want to say that if God ever heals you of cancer, it will disrupt everyone's life around you. That if God ever opens a blind eye around you, it will change your life. If God ever uh, heals deaf ears, it will change you, which is what he did for me. 
Y'all got it? Say, I got it. Can I keep on going? All right, we're going to keep on, keep on going further. So, so, the, so, so to, to answer your question, the Pentecostal services weren't wrong in principle, but in practice they created disorder. They weren't wrong in principle. They were just wrong in practice. And we don't try to do everything we know God can do in one hour. We give God room to do it in small groups and down the street and at your house. All right, question number four. Here we go. Question number four. How do you properly deal with a spouse that's focused more on religion than a relationship with God? Keep those elbows <laughs> right here. A few people said, can, can this be anonymous? This was one of them. Well, I'm going to take you straight to Scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Here's what it says. And if a believing woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to continue living with her, she must not leave him. For the believing wife brings holiness to her marriage and the believing husband brings holiness to his marriage. Otherwise, your children would not be holy, but now they are holy. A little, little, little extra there. But if the husband or wife who isn't a believer insists on leaving, come on, read the next three words. Let them go in such cases the believing husband or wife is no longer bound to the other for god has called you to live in peace don't you wives realize that your husbands might be saved because of you and don't you husbands realize that your wives might be saved because of you so here's what i would say to you listen whether they're in it for religion or relationship they're at least willing to engage in the conversation and they're willing to go and so it isn't a reason to divide it's a reason to encourage it's a reason to ask questions it's a reason to love and Paul says if they decide they want to go it's okay it's okay let if some, listen you can't force somebody to be with you but let's let's be a people who love Jesus so much that that love people even in our home same home that don't love God like we should love them back. Proverbs 25 and 15 says this. This is the only one I'm giving you two passages. It says, patience can persuade a prince and soft speech can break bones. Sometimes we think if we say it quietly that it's okay to say it. But soft speech can break bones just like harsh speech and loud speech. But listen, by being patient and loving, you may win somebody. By the way, that's how I correct my children in public. Some parents, when their children start getting crazy, they, they, get, they match their kids crazy loud. My kids know the lower my tone, the more likely they're going to die on the way home. <laughs> I just lean in, I whisper, I'm going to say, how do you want this to go? <laughs> Question number five. Is the nation of Israel important to Christianity? Thank you, sir. He's already answered the question. Yes, yes, unequivocally yes. Christianity began with Jesus who was a Jew. So many people seem to be confused at whether who Jesus was and his heritage. The Israelites are God's chosen people. God did pick a people and he's decided that through those people I'm going to save the whole world. And the Bible says that he grafted us into those people. So you and I are no longer Gentiles when we have faith in Jesus. We become sons and daughters of God. So why? Why is Israel so important to the, our nation? Because our nation was founded on biblical principles and biblical belief and ideals and we knew that we should work for the preservation of God's people saying more than y'all wanted me to say but Romans chapter 11 verse 1 says I say then has God cast away his people the apostle Paul says certainly not for I also am an Israelite the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin God has not cast away his people for whom he foreknew and then Paul begins to describe how Israel was rejected because of their lack of faith. They didn't accept Jesus as their Messiah. And because they didn't put their faith in Jesus, then they were rejected by God. And, and the, Romans 11 uses this language of like a beautiful olive tree, right? And he lopped off the branch of Israel because they wouldn't stay in the house of the tree of God. And the Bible says that they grafted in us who are Gentiles in. But then he says, you Gentiles shouldn't be arrogant because if God lopped off <laughs> the others, you should stay humble because he could lop you off. And if he could graft you in who was not a part of the tree, he could certainly graft them back in. Y'all getting this language, right? 
So he goes on to say, And so all Israel will be saved, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So we believe the nation of Israel is very important, and we, as, as leadership, we, we invest in the gospel in Israel since the inception of our church. We give and try to push the gospel in Israel because we believe that Judaism is the foundation of Christianity, and that's why our nation has been so successful because of our Judeo-Christian ethic. Galatians chapter 3, for those of you who need to found that you are actually a child of God through faith, says, understand then, Galatians 3, 7, understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you, so those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Now, concerning the attack on Israel, the role of the church is to pray to serve and to share the gospel. I'm going to say it one more time. The role of the church is to pray, to serve, and to share the gospel. We want everyone possible to be saved. And we believe that Jewish people can go to heaven and Palestinian people can go to heaven. Amen, everybody. Because, listen, he is looking to save us all. And if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you can be grafted into God's family. Now, the role of government, let me distinguish here, the role of the church is to pray, to serve, and to share the gospel. The role of the government is to resolve any conflict quickly and decisively. Prolonged wars do more damage. Just do a little history lesson. Any war that we've allowed to go on and on and on and on for 20 years seed more, uh, sowed more seeds of war in the future than things that were ended decisively. I will say the last two statements are my opinion, and I gladly shared them with you. <laughs> Number six, what would you tell someone who's tired of being micromanaged by their boss, but the Lord has said to submit? What's the difference between submission and being a doormat? <laughs> I love this question. Come on now. Don't you love this question? Submission in the Bible doesn't mean that anyone is of lesser value. There is erroneous teaching in the world that when you say, uh, where well, the Bible says wives should submit to their husband, that they're actually saying a woman is of lesser value. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that you should respect a person and choose to willingly submit to their authority. You're not a doormat, let me say it clear, and don't allow yourself to be treated that way. Submission is a decision to follow someone's leadership. So ask the Lord what he wants you to learn. Ask your boss for space to deliver results. Let me say this to you. Bosses became bosses because they have a system that was successful. And you have to show them your system can still produce that success. The reason that people are promoted is because they found a way to take care of business. And when they hire new people, they most often want you to do it the way they do it. But if you can show them that you can produce the results in a different way that's more in line with your gifts, sometimes you just got to ask for the room to do that. I tell our team all the time, you're not me and I'm not you. And if you can get to the end result faster, quicker, and easier than I did, please do that. But here's, here's our verse, Matthew 10 and 16 says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Come on, read it with me, every voice. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. You have to understand how the world works and how it engages, and you have to be wise as a serpent. You need to understand what serpents do, but not become a serpent in the process. So you need to maintain your ethics your godliness, your character in the environment need to honor them. And if they will not honor you, it may be time to start praying for God to show you a better place. Number seven. What steps have you taken to guard against moral failure? This is a big deal in my world. Currently, nine out of ten pastors, almost nine out of ten pastors don't retire as pastors. A couple of reasons. Burnout, finances, and moral failure. Three reasons. Burnout, 
finances, and moral failure. When they got to the time, uh, if they did make it through burnout and they didn't fall into moral failure, the way the church handled and the way they handled finances, they, they, they went to extremes. They either tried to live on everything, right, that, to, to be opulent and over the top, or they took a vow of poverty and they, they weren't able to, to pass anything to their children. So today, we create environments as a church where we're helping pastors to retire. By the way, that's one of the things we're doing in Bell Chase. We're coming alongside a 71-year-old pastor and saying, let us help you finish out your days so that you can retire in this role and make sure that a church doesn't close its doors. We're doing what what the Bible has asked us to do, not only in our biological family, but in his church family. You know that kids, that your parents store up for you to take care of you, and when your parents get old, you're supposed to store up and take care of them. It's God's plan. Some of y'all don't want to even say amen right there. Like, Pastor, move on, move on, move on. <laughs> so how, how, how do I guard against moral failure? You're probably not going to like this, but I'm going to say it real clear. I have hard boundaries in areas of temptation. I have hard stop boundaries. What are some of those? I am never alone with almost anyone, regardless of your gender. Anyone. We, we live in a crazy world. And I'm almost never, unless you are very trusted and in the family and we've got years of trust built right there, new person walking in, I got a big glass door. Every time you can meet with me, you can see me, I'd love to see you, but somebody else is going to be seeing me seeing you. We live in a world where one accusation can destroy my 25 years of good character and I refuse to give one person that opportunity. Amen, everybody? And so I have hard, hard boundaries, hard, harder than you think I do. I try to smile when I say them and I try to be kind about it. But you invite me to lunch, probably not going to go by myself unless it's very public, right? We're always going to create boundaries of protection and safety. Why? Because 2 Timothy 2.22 says, run from anything that stimulates youthful lust. Instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the name of the Lord with pure hearts. He said you should run. Young person, older person, if you're in a, in a situation where a gal or guy at work is showing you a, a affection that you know is kind of starting to feel flirtation, Bible says what? It says run, all right? It says see you later. It was nice being friends. I will talk to you from a distance. I will love you from a distance. And the church said amen. Amen. I want to encourage you today that we're, uh, through social media, we're allowing spirits of things to get into our lives and ideas of things that if it gets in your head and in your heart, it won't be long, it's in your hands. So fight the battle in your head and in your heart before it ever gets to your hands. None of us are without sin. That's why Jesus said if you lusted after a woman in your mind, you've committed adultery already. He was trying to up the ante before you ever got to the hand stuff. Say la. Number eight, is it okay as a Christian to step away from toxicity, conflict, rather than confront it and try to resolve it? What if you feel tired or upset because you've tried and always been the bigger person but feel helpless? Is ignoring that person completely really a good option? Let me just say, if you try to resolve an issue the way the Bible describes Go to Matthew chapter 18, says go to them privately. If they won't respond, bring somebody with you, don't, then talk to them. But by the way, just I think it was last week I did a whole message on how to resolve conflict. I think maybe you ought to go back to listen to that one if you missed it. But yes, there is a point if you've done your part, but they just want to be at war with you, then let's read what Romans 12 says. Romans 12 says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible... As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. (laughs) All right? So some of you say, I want to get them back. Paul says, no, no, just let God handle that. But the line, as far as it depends on you. You have to do what's necessary and even maybe uncomfortable for yourself to be at peace and make sure that you've done your part in resolving issues. But if you've tried and you've given yourself to it, yes, you may have to draw heavy lines and boundaries to prevent them continuing to ruin your life. A great book to read is a book by Dr. Henry Cloud and Dr. Townsend. Two doctors got together and they wrote a book called Boundaries. 
If you've never read the book Boundaries, I recommend three books to every person to read in their life. You should read the Bible over and over and over and over again. Number two, you should read the book Boundaries because it's going to teach you how to deal with crazy people and crazy things and how, how you feel like they, they have a right to take you on the roller coaster. They don't, all right? The, the third book that I recommend is called The Search for Significance. So many people feel that their life is insignificant and you need a biblical understanding of your significance in the world. Number nine, how should we participate in holidays that are pagan in origin? We start to see a merging of Christian and pagan holidays uh, when Christianity was legalized by Roman Emperor Constantine in 313 A.D. And because the emperor uh, legalized Christianity and became a Christian, some think that he was tired of having so many holidays because the pagans had holidays and the Christians had holidays. And he's like, my workforce is taking too much time off. I don't know if that's true. I just find it amusing. And so there was a merging of these holidays. And so almost every Christian holiday has a secular or pagan holiday attached to it. We celebrate resurrection of Jesus. But how many of y'all know a bunny rabbit has nothing to do with the resurrection of Jesus? But I sure do love, come on, bunny rabbit Reese's peanut butter cups. The rabbit's origins are in the goddess of fertility that they used to celebrate. Now, most of you didn't even know that. You just enjoy the candy and you celebrate Jesus. To you, I would say, just enjoy the candy and celebrate Jesus, right? Don't, don't create laws and legalism where we just don't need them. The Bible says in Titus chapter 1, uh, everything is pure to those who are pure, hearts are pure, but nothing is pure to those who's, who, who are corrupt and unbelieving because their minds and consciences are corrupted. So here's what I would say. Follow your personal conviction. Maybe you ought to look into every holiday and how much you should participate in it and whether it should be a part of your lives. But here as your pastor, I'm not going to start forbidding you from getting a Christmas tree or eating Reese's peanut butter cups as I've also affirmed every Sunday that you can do that. I think you should pray and follow your heart. Amen, everybody? Number 10, is polygamy a sin and how is it different or the same as adultery? Y'all notice we're going all over the place, right? Yes, polygamy is a sin. God's plan is clear in Genesis 1. One man and one woman. If God wanted one man to have 17 women, he would have did that in the garden and Adam would have had no ribs. That wasn't even in my notes. That's just the way my mind works. You ask, how is it different than adultery? Polygamy is different than adultery because both spouses have chosen to sin. Adultery quite often is one spouse stepping out without the other knowing. Polygamy is, let's come together and let's see how we can do this in a way that's dishonoring to God. And I just got to tell you guys, I'm never going to be a person who kind of raises a finger at God. I think if you want to find yourself in danger, look at something God said clearly and say, I don't care, I'm going to do it my way. You're asking for the most pain in your life. And by the way, can I just tell you, trying to pay for that many, <laughs> that, that many job interests. <laughs> I got to stop now. Let's keep on going. Your verse there is Genesis 1. God made a man and a woman. It's also the beginning of every other sexual sin that we might look at. Genders, homosexuality, all those things. We believe that God made a man and a woman. That's always been God's plan. That always will be God's plan. And a man and a woman is the foundation of the family. And the family is the foundation of our society. And the reason our nation is crumbling is because the family is crumbling. It's because we're allowing ideas like adultery and polygamy and, and gender changes and all these things to, to come into our lives. I just want to say to you, that is not God's plan for us. Let me say clearly, if you have same-sex attraction or you struggle with gender roles, if you have identity issues, that is okay. Ask the question. It is okay. Listen, having same-sex attraction is not the same as acting on it. We all think about sin. Can we be honest in here, everybody? 
We're all sinners in need of a Savior, including the guy on this stage. And we're not going to demonize one struggle over another struggle. So listen, if you're struggling with all those things, don't take my previous words and say, oh, well, they don't want me here. That's not true. I want every person with identity issues. I want every person who struggles. I would love to know you, care about you, and show you the heart of God. That's where we need to be. I'm running out of time, and I only got three more, okay? Here we go. Number 12. Oh, no. I'm sorry. Number 11. Can you lose your salvation? Are you saved if you prayed the prayer and were baptized, but nothing has changed? Well, listen, salvation is a past, present, and future thing. It's not a one-time thing because faith is not a prayer. Faith is an action. It's a verb. It's something that you do actively. So the Bible says, you're, Ephesians 2 says you're saved by faith, right, by, through God's grace in your life. And so faith is something that you actively participate in. And you're only saved if you have an active relationship with God. We have taught this, if I I like to say it this way, many Christians have added Christianity like an insurance policy. It doesn't work that way. Galatians 6.15 says, Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule. Your life... Remember what I said, the big things are Jesus, the Bible, and you must be born again? That verse says, listen, circumcision in their day was your way of saying, I'm really committed to God. Can you all imagine that membership class? (laughs) Praise God, you can be born again. Your life has to change. You don't have to be perfect. You just got to grow with him. Stay in faith. Can I lose my salvation? No, I don't ever intend to stop believing in God. I have made a decision. I will not. I am going to die believing Jesus is the son of God and the savior of the world. And I think if you have that faith, you'll never lose it. It will always be found in you, right? I got a couple more. I know Danny's here and he's just going to make it sound so majestic while I, while I read this next one. Ladies, ladies, men, can you explain 1 Corinthians 14? 34, 35, women should be silent in the church. And 1 Timothy 2, I I don't let women teach men. And why One Hope allows women to preach and pastor. Side note, thank you for the side note, by the way. I have enjoyed all the women that I've heard speak at One Hope. It just seems contrary to what the Bible says. You'll notice in today's world that a recent denomination decided to divide over this topic. There are two verses in the Bible that were written to two of the most problematic church issues they were having and Paul wrote specifically to the problem in the church in Corinth and to the church that that Pastor Timothy was overseeing and both of them are very very rooted in that issue I say well pastor how do I know that remember when I said we let the Bible define and balance itself how do I know because I could show you 30 other places where Paul and Jesus and everybody else violated those two verses so what's the balance The balance is, let me just read you some examples. The balance is Deborah led the entire nation of Israel. Anna, the prophetess, that's an office of fivefold ministry, prophesied over Jesus when he was eight days old. Priscilla taught Apollos about the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. Prominent women helped Paul build the church. He just said there's a prominent women. Uh, God created men and women. Jesus elevated women in every context. He was one of these people that would talk to who are, why are you talking to the woman at the well? Because Jesus was violating all cultural standards to talk to a woman by himself. Why? Why did he do that? Because he loved women and he believed in women and he created them with God in the beginning. And the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit empowered women on the day of Pentecost. If all of that is there, I'm not going to get hung up on two verses that we're dealing with two very focused issues. Because if it was an implicit rule, it wouldn't have been just in those two verses. Paul, would, have, when he put down the list, he would have said, apostles can only be men and prophets can only be men, except that he praises all the others. So our practice is to say those verses say what they say. They do. And if our church starts getting out of hand, men or women, we're going to say, you should be quiet. Because everything we do is in a fitting and orderly way. Got to keep on going. Number 13, number 13, what happens to a person when they die if they never heard the gospel? The assumption here is that if no one shared the gospel with them, how can they be held accountable? 
God has revealed himself and is revealing himself in multiple ways. People sharing the gospel, as mentioned, is one of them. The word of God written so that people can read actually reveals God to them. Dreams, visions, prophecies, and epiphanies where God opens your eyes. There are actually testimonies of people in villages. When missionaries got to the villages, they were already Christians when they got there and they had no known knowledge of any person ever coming with the gospel. Why? They had an epiphany. God showed himself to them, all right? And then lastly, lastly, creation. Creation calls out to us. I love this quote from an unknown author. It says, to be an atheist, I'd have to believe nothing produced something, non-life produced life, randomness produced precision, and chaos produced order. I simply do not have that much faith. Romans chapter 1 says, for ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky through everything God made, and they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature. Come on, read it with me. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. He doesn't just reveal himself by me talking to you. God is God, and he is not unjust. When you stand before him, you will have either accepted or denied him. Here's our last, and we close. Number 14. What would you say is the greatest need of the church today? The big C church, not just one hope. What I would say to you today as your pastor is the greatest need of the church is that Christians need a biblical worldview. We have a secular worldview. Here in America, we have an American gospel. Today, I just need you to know I need you to have a biblical worldview and I need you to live a great commission life. That means the reason why you're here is not just so that you will go to heaven. That's beautiful. It's so that your life and your effort will be poured into other people's lives and they will be changed. That's why Jesus said right before he ascended in Matthew chapter 28, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The final words of Jesus is that we should live our lives, we should work our jobs and raise our families and serve in our church with a biblical worldview. And we should live a Great Commission life that everything we do is about knowing him and making him known in the world. Today, I invite you to that as we close. Would you bow with me in prayer all around this room? With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and you've sensed God's presence and you've really considered some of the things that have been said today, but you still feel that you're far from God, if that's you, I want to say to you, the Bible is clear. You're one prayer away from closing the distance and having a real relationship with God. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I won't embarrass you. I won't ask you to stand or come to the front. But if you're here and you'd like to invite Jesus into your life, if you'd like to begin this process of growing and having a biblical worldview, would you whisper this prayer? Say these words with me all around this room. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm giving you my life. And I'm asking you to be my Lord and my Savior. God, would you forgive me for my sin? Would you forgive me for trying to live this life my own way? And God, would you give me the power to follow you all the days of my life? In Jesus' name.